Today we're heading to Boyock Brook to check out the Skeleton Bridge, which was built in 1912. This was part of a train line that spurred off from Donnybrook and went through here all the way to Kojana. It was closed in 1982, but it's called the, the Skeleton Bridge because of a open sleeper pattern or something like that. Apparently it's now been filled in and it's just a name that's stuck. So we're gonna go on a bit of a hike. It's supposed to be very nice. It's a lovely day. Looking forward to it. Let's go. So here we are at the Boyle Brook train station. There's the original station master building where they sold tickets and held parcels, whatnot. And over here was the good shed. There were a few more structures around here at the time which are now gone. I asked for some help from Rail Heritage WA and they were very useful. There used to be a structure here specifically for women to wait and use the bathroom. And there was also a turntable right at the end there. We'll see if there's any remains of that, but supposedly that was manufactured in Philadelphia. So this is just a stop on the spur line connected from Donnybrook. And that was the Bunbury Manjimup line. The line opened between Katanning and Kojanup in 1907 and was extended from Kojanup to Boyup Brook in 1912. And that's where our bridge was constructed. The bridge we're visiting today was actually one of 27 bridges on the whole line, which is quite a lot considering the train line was only 80 kilometers long. I'm not sure what any of this is used for now. I have a feeling we might actually be on private property, but there's no signs telling us to keep out. So that way leads to Donnybrook. On the way in here, driving down south, we actually stopped where the rail line ended. And surprisingly, there was a rail line there. So I'm just gonna cut briefly to a previous me and we'll go on a mini adventure within an adventure. So if you follow the train line far enough from Skeleton Bridge, you'll end up here on the outskirts of Donnybrook. And the track's actually still here. And if we follow it along further enough, we should actually get to where it connects to the Bunbury and, uh, what was it, Manjimup train line? I don't have my notes on me, so I can't check, but we can see there's still remains of sleepers and whatnot. And I don't know how overgrown this is going to be. There's no photos of really anything online. I've, I've just found this by following the train reserve on Langate. The boundary for it is still there, so you can still follow it as if the train line still exists. And uh, this is where I've ended up. Looks like there's a couple of hundred meters to walk. All right, so excuse the noise. We're right on the edge of the Southwestern Highway at the moment, but as we can see, it's just getting more and more overgrown. So these very mature looking trees growing out between the tracks. It's pretty amazing really. This is actually much cooler than I thought it would be. We've walked maybe 150 meters all up so far from the car. That's the Southwestern Highway there where that truck just went past. So it looks like Maybe this is part of a nature reserve or something, or like a nature walk, I meant to say. I'm not entirely sure. Looks like we're going over some old bridge at the moment. I can hear water running. There's like a waterfall there or something. We'll have to check it from a different angle. Obviously this fence wouldn't have been here when the train line was. That's what makes me think that it's part of some sort of walk. Wasn't able to find any information online, however. There we are, we've popped up <laughs> out onto Southwestern Highway. And the tracks end, but up there you can see the existing Bunbury train line. There we go. That's what the waterfall looks like. Coming out through some culverts. That's where we were just walking. Very cool. Very nice. Well, zooming back into the modern day. This is where the rail line currently ends. So unfortunately, the turntable appears to have been dismantled. Probably sometime in the 1960s. 
And there was also an amenities room up here as well, which is where the drivers could stop and rest and store stuff. But anyway, here's the trail. We'll head down there and we'll find this bridge. Okay, so I did hear that this walk trail can be a little bit difficult to follow, so I've tried to do my due diligence online beforehand, so we've sort of just basically walked past the back of an industrial area. And here we have a creek. So luckily there is a bridge, and the remains of another bridge, not the bridge we're walking to, however. I learned yesterday that this is called a Ford. A crossing, a vehicle crossing like this, somewhat shallow, so vehicles and whatnot can get across. So there's the remains of the other bridge there, and luckily there is a pedestrian footbridge for me and Annika. Yeah, we have the remains of some footings there. Like I said, this route had quite a lot of bridges. And here we have some more substantial ruins. So now that we can see some ruins, let's read some facts. I like facts. So what type of trains ran on this line? Well, as you can imagine, for the industries based around here, there was a lot of grain, fertilizer, and wool. The maximum speed of the train was only 40 kilometers an hour, thanks to the many sharp turns on the line. Speaking of these sharp turns, just throughout the 1970s, there were 13 derailments, thanks to these curves. It makes you wonder how many, how many derailments there were total for the entire life of the line, considering it operated for 80 years. So, this ruin's pretty cool, I guess. I do have high hopes for the other ruin. The only thing else worth noting is that it does appear on some old survey maps, which I found at the State Library. And as a surveyor myself, I do love survey maps. Anyway, let's follow the trail and keep things moving. So we're just past the remains of that first bridge now. We can see the railway alignment, the embankment. It's all overgrown now. As far as I can tell, there isn't any tracks, but this walk does seem quite nice. Apparently it's quite an easy walk to do. It's there's different sources online of exactly how long it is, but somewhere between five and six kilometers. And I believe a, a website somewhere listed it as grade two, which means it's very easy. We're not too far into the walk and there's definitely been some good scenery to view so far. I should point out that today is actually the very last day of winter. So it's probably a perfect time to come for a walk down here. All the flowers are out. And because it is the last day of winter, I should point out that today is actually our 10 year anniversary. So. That's sort of the reason we're down there, uh, down here. And Annika has been very kind in letting me film these videos on our anniversary holiday. Okay, so the landscape's changed again now. We're in some open fields. As far as I can tell, the railway alignment would have run along here. Hard to tell now. It's all fields and private property. I believe that building over there, the big one, was a mill of some sort. Um, yeah, it wasn't, a wasn't a timber mill. It was something else. And it was very important during World War II because apparently it was one of the biggest manufacturers of whatever the mill did at the time. Flax, uh, help me out here, flax meat. Um, flax meat? Oh no, not <laughs> flax meat. All right, whatever it is, I'll put it up on screen now. But that's all part of the caravan park now, so it's not exactly abandoned. Not exactly sure what those sheds are for. That could just be a part of a, a farm, although there is a, a firing range around here, apparently. So if we hear some shots popping off in the distance, we need not be worried. Well, I found the firing range. It says there's supposed to be a flag flying when they're live firing, which nearly rhymes. But so far, it has been quite an enjoyable walk it's basically just a country track, really, but I haven't really seen much in the way of railway remains, which is, of course, what I've been keeping my eye out for. And oh, as an addendum to the previous conversation, it is it was a flax mill. There's still reception around here, so I was able to quickly look it up on Google Maps. But like I said, it is a caravan park now, so can't really go and check it out. But supposedly it was quite historic. All right, it's not very exciting even by my standards, and I get very excitable 
but we do have some remains of railway sleepers here. And obviously not much, but looks like we might have the remains of some ballast there as well. Not sure. Anyway, we're continuing our walk and I'll keep you updated. Bless you. Okay, we're starting to see more and more railway sleepers. Hopefully that means we're getting close. We have been walking for a, a fair distance now, but it looks like there is a gully coming up. And a gully is a perfect place to build a bridge. And here we are, we've made it. Look at that, what a beauty. I love how it has a ever so slight curve to it, even though it's made out of wood. Obviously it's running over the Blackwood River, which is running next to where we're staying. And of course here is the top where they're trying to keep people out. And considering there has not been a, a train run over this in 50 years, that's probably for the best. The Rail Safety Act of 2010, so I'm guessing this fence hasn't always been here. So while we're all having a look at this and enjoying it, let's read some more facts. So as for its dimension, uh, dimensions, I was, there's basically two sets of facts. So according to the internet, it spans 80 meters. It drops 12 meters from its center point, so it's quite high. And that's it for the internet information. On the information board behind me, it says it's 117 meters in length and that there's only an eight meter drop. And I can't talk, I have no idea how large the drop is without my total station, but 117 meters does roughly match what, uh, you know, if you use the, uh, the measurement tool on the land gate. So it's nice they did leave at least a little bit of railway line stuff here. And while I didn't see a single sign for the fact that there is a trail and a bridge here, I found all the information online, I do have a little information hut and a table to sit on. So it looks like people have been collecting old bits of uh, railway stuff. You know, these, these would have been for the sleepers to hold them into place. Um, and there's a, a cooler there next to a, a boogie board for some reason. And here we have some old photos of the, of the bridge in operation, which is cool because I wasn't able to find any of these online. And as we can see there, it does look pretty damaged in 1978, but we will get to that in a sec. So as you saw in that photo, it was partially destroyed by a fire in 1978. This was thanks to Cyclone Albi. So Cyclone Albi was the most devastating cyclone ever in Western Australian history. Inland bushfires were worsened by the cyclone as there was no, as there were gale force winds and no rain to help with the fire suppression. It was also completely submerged by a flood caused by a tropical cyclone Bruno in 1982. And this is more or less the reason that it was closed. The bridge itself was okay from the flood, as you can see, it's still here 50 years later, but that same flood caused extensive damage to the portion of the line in Maradup. So I visited the State Library and I found a lot of dry West Rail material, uh, you know, case studies and why the line should be closed and the like. And it was incredibly boring for most of it, but I did gleam some interesting facts. So the track was already in a poor condition in 1982. This is when they were doing these reports. It was estimated that 76% of the railway slippers would be ineffective. That's their terminology, not mine, by 1990. It was also estimated that the track would need to be completely rebuilt by 1987 at a cost of $4.7 million, and that's in early 80s money. So we can see the uh, deterioration of the bridge is more apparent than others. That bit of wood there looks like it's about to fall off. It's pretty dangerous, really. I would not want to be walking across there. So, in one report I read, it was decided that it would be cheaper for the state government to close the line and rely on road transport instead. They even calculated that road accidents would only rise by 0.6%, with 0.004% of those being fatal. 
I have no idea how you would calculate that. I guess there must be existing statistics you can draw from. I think there's every chance I just pulled that number out of their head. Out of their ass, I should say, but mostly out of their head. They also anticipated that 16 West Rail staff would be made redundant. 11 of those were in operations and five in track maintenance. Maintenance. Thankfully, they were all relocated. West Rail budgeted $500 per employee for resettlement. Although I'm not sure how many of them would want to be resettled. I assume they probably would have lived in the local area. Regardless, there's a very blunt conclusion at the end of this uh, report I read, and it basically said West Rail would be financially better off by $1.8 million over 10 years. And again, that's in 1980s money. Even though the last train did run on this track in 1982, it wasn't formally closed until 1987 when they considered running the trains again. And it was at that point they decided to cease all operations forever. All right, despite my best judgment, I've got my bathers on and I'm gonna to go to the other side. So Annika's filming me with my phone if I fall over and eat shit. So let's go. And I'm obviously holding onto this camera for dear life and oh gosh, that's cold. <laughs> regret, regret. Oh, I meant to take my shirt off. It's all right, hold on. Let's go. Oh, it's so silty on the bottom. How deep am I willing to go? That's the question. Oh, f this is freezing. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Let's go. Well, I'm actually, it's actually pushing me a lot more than I thought it would. Oh, I can feel stuff touching my feet. <laughs> Yeah, the push of the water is actually a lot more than I thought it would be. Ow! There's bits of fallen bridge in the water. Oh. Okay. Halfway there. Oh, I don't know if this is incredibly stupid. Hopefully it's incredibly funny looking at least. All right, it's getting a little bit shallower. Basically waist deep at the moment. Oh. Oh, there we go. I think I made it. <laughs> oh. Gosh. That was bloody freezing. <laughs> Okay, so we've made it to the other side of the bridge. Definitely gonna be looking forward to the crossing. We can get a closer look at this side of the bridge. So it is relatively warm today. I think it's sort of like somewhere between sort of 23, 24, 25 degrees. So it could be worse. There hasn't been much rain recently, so I did have hopes that the, the bridge wouldn't be, sorry, the river wouldn't be too flowing, but just the way it is. And I decided to cross the bridge via the water because there is, as far as I can tell, there's no other bridges in the vicinity. You can, however, drive and there's a road, but it's quite a hike from what I could tell. So why not just cross the river? What could go wrong? Obviously I made it across with no issues. We'll see how the the return trip goes. So obviously this side of the train line is far less trodden. We're in a cutting here on the other side of the bridge. And here's the other side. I have not seen any other photos or videos of this side of the bridge. As far as I know, I am the first one to do it and document it online. So you're welcome. So we have the same sign there, a much smaller fence. Be much easier to get over if I was so inclined. What we got here, bridge 32, line 76. 32, didn't I say there was 20 something bridges on the entire line? My notes are obviously on the other side of the bridge. It's probably the most abandoned cutting like that I've ever seen. 
but I assume probably most of the train line looks like that. Let's have one final look at this part of the railway line, this part of the bridge, I should probably say, and make our crossing back. Obviously there isn't too much to look at, but we can definitely see how nicely it curves, and I just, I love how it curves. I'm not sure why they made it curve like that. I guess there's probably a practical reason, but it certainly does look nice. You'd think they would just build it straight across, but I guess back in those days, in the early 1900s, you know, earthworks were a lot more difficult back then than they are now. Just would have been easier to contour it, contour it to the land, even if it did mean they had to make it on this nice curve. I wouldn't want to be getting on those platforms. I can imagine putting even a little bit of weight on those is probably all they need to fall off. All right, let's have another look under the bridge on this side and then we'll make our way back across. Nothing worth saying, but that is just a lovely view. As we head down this hill, this is very hard to do in slides. <laughs> I do all these videos in boots usually. So getting up and down embankments like this is usually quite a bit easier. But let's have another look under this bridge while we're here, you know, in the area. Pretty much untouched really. I did notice up in the cross beams there, you see like bits of wood, like driftwood. There has been a few floods. The most recent one being in 2016. I'll throw a photo of that up in the outro. But I can imagine it's probably happened quite a few times. I'll have to remember to get a shot where Anika's sitting. You can see about five different pieces of wood jammed up there. See up there you can sort of see couple of pieces. But it's just an, an awesome piece of engineering. And it's kind of sad that a train hasn't run over it in 40 odd years, but obviously I wouldn't be exploring it today if it had. All right, let's go back into the cold water and uh, Hopefully this time I don't fall in. So goodbye that side of the bridge. And oh my god, that's just really deep sand. Basically just sunk straight into it. So the force of this, this river is actually quite strong. Not enough to sweep me away at least, which is good. Oh, but we're at the halfway point now. Definitely easier the second time. Oh, it's got to be careful around here. There's a bunch of junk in the water, so I don't want to stick my foot through something. Oh, the current's getting pretty strong here. But we're starting to go up now. Ouch, across some rocks. Ouch. Slimy, slippery, and cold. But there we are. I've made it. Time to get dry. All right, so that was quite the interesting video just because of the crossing, I guess. I'm very wet. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, yeah, so I was talking about flooding while I was on the other side of the bridge. So there was a big flood here in 2016, and I found this photo on the Boyop, Brook, Boyop Brooks Police Twitter page, or X page, I guess, and I'll put it on screen now, but as you can see, the water was pretty much all the way up to the top. And that's why I was mentioning the bits of wooden, wood and driftwood and whatever else that was stuck up there. Obviously, that's been from the floods. I'm not sure how else they would get up there, honestly. So, like I said, it's a pretty easy hike to get here. It only takes maybe 20, 25 minutes of walking. And that's, that, it's a boomerang trip. So it's about five or six kilometers all up. We did, in 2015, we lost the uh, Long Gully Bridge in Dwelling Up, which was a very similar bridge. So. These things obviously being made out of wood, they are susceptible to bushfires and the like, so I would recommend coming out and seeing it while we can. And hopefully it doesn't burn down, hopefully it's here for a lot longer than all of us. But that's all we have for today, thank you so much for watching. Please remember to hit that like and subscribe button if you would like to see more and stay informed, and it also helps out the algorithm as well. The more people that do that, the more YouTube 
spreads the vibes and the good words. So yeah, I'm gonna go dry off. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.